Today we're gonna to look at a really interesting product identity involving two very important constants and then two very important arithmetic functions. And this comes from the paper, A Golden Product Identity for E by R. Schneider from Math Magazine in 2014. So in particular, we'll show that E is the product as N goes from one to infinity of one minus one over the golden ratio to the N power, all raised to the mu of N minus phi of N over N. Okay, well, let's uh, decode what all of these parts are. In other words, we're gonna look at the main players of this identity which we will construct. So we're gonna set psi equal to the golden ratio. We're gonna set that instead of phi because we'll use something else for free, phi. So let's recall that the golden ratio is half times one plus the square root of five. It's also defined as the positive root of this equation psi squared equals psi plus one, or I should say psi satisfies that. And then we'll look at Euler's totient function. Remember that counts the numbers between one and n that are relatively prime to n. In other words, their GCD with n is one. So for example, phi of 15 is the number of elements in the following set, which is equal to eight. Notice I simply listed all of the numbers that are relatively prime to 15. Next up, we're gonna look at another arithmetic function, which is mu of n. And it depends on a number being square free or not square free. A number is square free if, well, it's not divisible by any perfect squares. So in other words, if we take its prime factorization, all of the primes in that prime factorization have an exponent of one. Okay, so mu of n will be equal to zero when n is not square free. So in other words, it's divisible by a perfect square. It's equal to one if it is square free and then it has an even number of prime factors. And it's equal to negative one if it's square free and it has an odd number of prime factors. Furthermore, we're gonna use the following known results about the Euler phi function and this mu function. The first is that if we sum over all of the divisors of n of phi of d, we get n. So let's look at two examples of that. So the divisors of 15 are 1, 3, 5, and 15. And if we sum over, well, the Euler phi function evaluated at those numbers, that's the same thing as summing 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8, but that gives us 15. You can easily check that these are the values of the Euler phi function at these divisors. Furthermore, if we look at the sum over the divisors of 12, it all works out also. And so we can prove this in general, but we won't do that. So there's this similar result for the mu function, and it says if you sum up over all of the divisors of n, you get one if n is equal to one, and zero if n is bigger than one. So let's look at some examples of that. So if we sum up over all of the divisors of 15, notice all of the divisors of 15 are square free. So that means, well, we're gonna get either one or negative one, depending on if it has an even number or an odd number of prime factors. So one has an even number of prime factors. Well, zero is an even number, so that gives us a one here. Three and five both have an odd number of prime factors, well, themselves. So that gives us two minus ones in a row, and then 15 has an even number of prime factors, three and five, so that gives us another plus one. But obviously one minus one minus one plus one is zero. And we can do a similar calculation for 12. Notice we get zero appearing a couple of times because notice four is not square free. It's a perfect square. And then 12 is also not square free. It's divisible by four. So that's why we pick up those zeros, but we still get zero in the end when we add everything together. Okay, so now that we've got all of these like important parts sorted out, let's prove a couple of lemmas starting with this one here. Okay, so looking at this identity, we're just gonna start with the left-hand side and work towards the right-hand side. So notice I've got negative, the sum as n goes from one to infinity of phi of n over n times the natural log of one minus x to the n. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is bring this minus sign inside. 
and I'm gonna deposit it with this natural log. So now I've got the sum as n goes from one to infinity of phi of n over n times negative natural log of one minus x to the n. But now I'm gonna write that negative natural log of that stuff, well, as a certain integral. So let's do that. So this is gonna be equal to the sum as n goes from one to infinity. I'm just bringing some stuff down here. So we've got phi of n over n. And then this bit right here can be expressed as the integral from zero to x to the n of one over one minus t dt. So if we take the antiderivative of this, because of the chain rule, we get negative natural log of one minus t. And then evaluating that at zero and x to the n, well, it deposits us this right up here. And you might be worried because I don't have an absolute value here, but for the purposes of what we're doing, we'll actually only need the value of x to be between zero and one. So let's maybe point that out here. x is between zero and one. Next up, what we'll do is expand this as a series. So that's a simple geometric series. So we have the sum as n goes from one to infinity. We still have our phi of n over n. And now this is, well, it'll be the sum as k goes from zero to infinity of the integral from zero to x to the n of t to the k dt. So I also exchanged the order of summation and integration, but that's totally allowed here. But now let's look at this integral right here, which is fairly easy to calculate via the power rule. So we need to increase the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent. So that'll give us t to the k plus one divided by k plus one, evaluated between zero and x to the n. So that'll give us x to the n k plus n over k plus one. Okay, so we have something like that. But now before we plug that into our sum and maybe start the next step, I'm gonna do a little bit of re-indexing. And that re-indexing will be to take this k and replace it with, let's see, it'll be k minus one. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. Now we'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity and then the sum as k goes from one to infinity of phi of n over n times k times x to the n times k. So we picked up a k in the denominator from this k plus one that's been re-indexed. And we have got this n k in the exponent, again, because of the re-indexing and the fact that we had an x to the n k plus n there. Okay, great. But now I'd like to re-index this a little bit more. And I'm gonna re-index this maybe like in terms of the power of x that I see. So what I'll do here is that I'll set m equal to n times k. And then I'll switch the order of summation. So this is gonna be a little bit tricky, but I think if we are just careful with it, it'll be okay. So now this will be equal to the sum as m goes from one to infinity of the sum of n dividing m. Because notice, no longer are we really summing over all of the n values. The n values have to be divisors of m based off of this re-indexing that we have right here. Okay, and then here we'll have phi of n over m times x to the m. That's after that re-indexing. Next up, since the inner sum only depends on n, we can factor the x to the m over m out. So let's do that. So this will leave us with the sum. As m goes from one to infinity, we have x to the m over m. And then inside of that sum, we have the sum of n dividing m of phi of n. But now we can use that formula that we mentioned earlier when we sum over phi of the divisors of a certain number, and we'll know that this sums up to the number m. But that'll cancel the m that's in the denominator, simply leaving us with the sum as m goes from one to infinity of 
x to the m. But then by the geometric series summation rule, that'll be starting term over one minus common ratio. So that'll be x over one minus x. But look, that's exactly where we wanted to end up here. And now we'll move on to our next result, which on the left-hand side, it looks exactly the same, except phi of n has been replaced with mu of n. So I've got it started up here, but we're actually gonna skip a bunch of steps, just given the fact that these are identical to what we did on the last board up until a certain point, because phi of n didn't play a role until fairly far into the calculation. So let's jump to that point. So here we had this was equal to the sum as m goes from one to infinity of x to the m over m times the sum over the divisors of m. So in other words, n divides m of mu of n. But let's recall that this was that nice piecewise function. So this was equal to zero when m was bigger than one and it was equal to one if m is equal to one. So we can exhibit that as like a delta function. So this is like delta m comma one. So like I said, in other words, this is one if m is equal to one and zero if m is not equal to one. Okay, but notice that's going to collapse this infinite sum to a finite sum, but not just a finite sum, only a single term. And that'll be the term when m is equal to one. So that's going to give us x to the one over one, in other words, x. But that's exactly where we wanted to end up. So we already have this second identity. And now we're ready for our final calculation. So let's start by recalling that we have psi squared equals psi plus one. But we can rewrite that a couple of different ways. Notice that we can divide everything by psi here and we'll have psi equals one over psi plus one. Okay, so that's maybe like an equivalent definition of psi. But then also we can maybe move some things around and we'll have psi times psi minus one equals one. So we get that from moving this psi over and then factoring something out. But now we can divide this by psi minus one to give us something like this. We have psi equals one over psi minus one, but then maybe multiplying by one over psi over one over psi, we get the following expression. Okay, great. So now at this point, we're gonna take this equation and solve it for the number one. So that gives us one equals psi minus one over psi. But now I'm gonna go over here and take this version of psi. So in fact, I'm trying to get this all in terms of one over psi because that's between zero and one. So that's in the interval of convergence of these two series. So that's kind of the strategy here. Okay, so anyway, this is gonna be one over psi over one minus one over psi minus one over psi. Oh, but check it out. That's exactly equal to the limit as x goes to one over psi of x over one minus x minus x. Okay, so now we've set it up. Now we can replace this x over one minus x minus x with these two over here. So let's see what that leaves us with. So we're gonna have this is equal to the limit as x goes to one over psi of, let's see, we'll replace this x over one minus x with this right here. So that'll be minus the sum as n goes from one up to infinity of our phi of n over n times our natural log of one minus x to the n. Well, let's maybe color code this. So we just made this replacement in the magenta underlining. And then next up, we need to subtract off x. But notice subtracting off x is gonna cancel this minus sign. So that'll give us a plus the sum as n goes from one to infinity of we have our mu of n over n, natural log of one minus x to the n. And then let's maybe color code this as well. So let's maybe underline this in blue and this in blue. 
but those series are really set up to combine quite nicely. They both have a one over n term and a natural log of one minus x to the n. So putting those two things together, I have the limit as x goes to one over psi of, well, let's see, we're gonna have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of, we'll have mu of n minus phi of n over n times the natural log of one minus x to the n. But now since psi is, like I said before, in the radius of convergence here, we can simply evaluate this at x equals one over psi. So that's gonna leave us with the sum as n goes from one to infinity of mu of n minus phi of n over n and then we have the natural log of one minus one over psi to the n. Okay, great. But now let's maybe take a step back and see what we have. So we have one equals this infinite sum. So now if we take the two ends of that equation and we exponentiate, so let's say that this yellow arrow is just exponentiating, well, exponentiating the number one gives us, well, the number e. And exponentiating over there, well, it'll change a sum into a product, and then we can use log rules to do more. In fact, we'll get the product as n goes from one up to infinity of one minus one over psi to the n all raised to the mu of n minus phi of n over n. But look, that's exactly what we wanted over here. So there we've done it. We've established our golden product identity for E. So maybe let me know what you thought about this in the comments. And do you have your favorite identity involving E? Maybe post that in the comments as well. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.